Hello, good afternoon. I'm Arad Natale. I'll be chairing today's excellent panel on the making of Children of 9-11, Our Story. This moving to our documentary transmitted on Channel 4 this week on Monday and of course is now available streaming on all four. You can watch it in the USA on PBS under the title Generation 9-11 on the 31st of August, when you'll also be able to watch in France and Germany on Arte, followed by international release across various countries. I'm really delighted um, today to welcome this panel to talk about this really important film. Next month will be 20 years since those four planes were hijacked and deliberately crashed, resulting in the deaths of thousands. This film follows um, six children born after their fathers died on that day to unveil the hidden costs of the tragedy. And its commissioning process was unique and a story in itself. So today we're bringing together the, uh, the commissioners and production staff to explore the filming of these intimate stories. As the title suggests, and given current events, there may be some really distressing issues discussed in today's session. Remember, you can ask questions throughout the, uh, the uh, session today using the chat on the YouTube page. I will try and come to as many questions as I can and I'll largely leave them till the end, but please do feel free to send in your questions at any time. Children of 9-11, Our Story is an Arrow Pictures production and was co-funded by Channel 4 here in the UK, PBS in the United States and Arte in France. We have two of those comm commissioners joining us today. From the US, we have Bill Gardner, VP of Programmes and Development and development at PBS. And here in the UK, we have Danny Horan, Head of Factual for Channel 4. On the production side, we're very pleased to have John Smithson, Creative Director of Arrow Pictures, Lucy Redoubt, Executive Producer at Arrow Pictures, and Liz Merman, the Director, who's also joining us from the US. Welcome all, and thanks so much for joining us. There's so much to talk about today. I'd like to look at the production process as well as this really interesting three-way international commissioning model, which we're seeing becoming ever more popular in television today. But first, let's meet some of these children of 9-11. Miley Raquel Hale. Diane Hale McKenzie. Richard B. Hall. Stanley R. Hall. You have so many eyes on you being one of the youngest kids. And my father, Sebastian Gorky, who I never met because I was in my mom's belly. For a nine-year-old, you can't really comprehend it, but being able to be a part of that was something extraordinary. He um, scribbled over his name. My mom wanted us to put these over our beds. Laudunia, hey! These are his sunglasses, I know that. When we sent over the, the home videos that, and I heard my um, dad speak on one of the videos. That was the first time I ever heard his voice. Hey, stinky butt, you gonna dance or what? I think, and just with tragedy in general, I think it's very easy to kind of shut down and hate the world around you because, you know, why would something like that happen to me? But I don't know if that's more of like a grief thing and then you get over that but I was born and it already happened. And I just grew up being like, okay, this is, this is what, you know, my life is. So John, welcome. As creative director, you were responsible for the, the development of this idea and contacting those uh, contributors. And we've seen there were around about 105 unborn children whose fathers were killed at 9-11. Tell us a little bit about the genesis of the idea and how you went about developing it. Um, well, I've been responsible for eight or nine 9-11 films uh, in the last 20 years and all were about the day itself, the experience of the day. 
And I had a really strong feeling about wanting to do something, wanting to do something for the 20th anniversary, but wanting to do something different and really looking forward from the day rather than going back to the day and really not yet again dealing with all those archive, powerful archive shots that we covered so many times. And really from that sprung the idea of Generation 9-11. And it was really initially in conversation with Bill at PBS, uh, who very strongly was saying the same thing about looking forward, not back. And then we sort of hit on that specific the kids, and then we came up with the even tighter organizing principle that they wouldn't just be, they would be children with that very powerful link that they were in the womb when their father, uh, their fathers were died in the Pentagon on one of the planes or in the Twin Towers. And, uh, and so obviously they grew up with the loss of, of a father they never, they never knew. And that really was how it started uh, and 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 with with Bill and then with all our other partners uh, thereafter. And so, how did you go about reaching out to these hundred and five potential contributors? What was the process, and how how do you even start to do that? Um, incredible, painstaking research over what stretched to nine months. There are organisations that can point you towards some of the kids. But there was a lot we found that had never uh, been approached before. It was 105. I think we actively communicated with about 80 of them. And then it was a question of really whittling down, trying to represent as widely as possible uh, the families um, with the tragic uh, loss of a, a father on, on, on that day. So I think we went from 55 and then... With our partners, we had a short list of around 20 individuals, and it's really all agreeing from that on the six or seven that we um, selected for the film. But it was a nine-month process to find and to talk to and just to get that balance, to try and come up with a, a representative picture of, of these, this Generation 9-11. Thank you. And um, I'd like to go to Lucy. Um, you were the exec producer um, at Arrow Pictures, and I, I understand that you came on board once the film was greenlit. Um, how did you go about choosing your final six or seven contributors from the 20? It wasn't an easy task. I'll start with that, as we all know, um, when, you're, when you're trying to cast. But we felt it was it was very important that 9-11, although it happened you know, in America, in New York, that it was it's a global story. And it was very important to get representation that that touched as many countries as possible. So when you meet the contributors and their families, we have people from, you know, whose families reached to Poland, to Germany, to Brazil, people whose whose fathers were painters and decorators or someone who was in the military, somebody who's on, on the plane. We wanted to really represent the, the wide impact of 9-11 of on, on the world. And that was really important to us. Yeah, I, I understand that you um, your contributors come from around six different states in the US and actually touch around five or six countries internationally in terms of heritage or um, or uh, subsequently immigrating as well. Um, so, I mean, I think it's really clear that, that the diversity of the contributors, their backgrounds, um, their father's jobs, where they live now, and an element of who they've become was obviously really important to you. Um, I also, uh, we spoke earlier about the decision to um, include a, a contributor called Faraz, who is from Yemen, and his father was killed um, helping to rescue people during um you know, this, the subsequent rescue mission and never knew his father because he didn't live in the States. Um, he, however, was born before 9-11. Tell us a little bit about your decision to include him amongst the others who were still in the womb. Absolutely. So we felt very, very importantly from the beginning as, as, as a wider, wider team that um, it was important to have a Muslim voice as part of that to talk about the impact on those communities. And there were very few, like one or two, maybe only one, who who fitted into that lens of not having been born on 9-11. 
And as you can understand, this is, this is a very brave process for any contributor to be involved in. And they felt very strongly that they, they, they weren't ready to go on this journey. But we didn't want to just give up at that point. So we, we searched really hard and, and we found Fares, who was living in Yemen and his father was based in New York um, and was preparing the visas for the family to come over when the tragedy struck. But Fares ne had never met his father. He was only two or three. So we felt that still fitted our lens that he grew up without the father he never knew. But he was also able to give us that sort of wider global and, and sort of the, the, the Muslim voice in the film that was so important. Yeah. And was it important to you that he he subsequently, I think for the last year or two, does live in the United States now, although he grew up in Yemen. I mean, it, it was important in the sense that it was practically helpful, given we were filming during COVID to have everyone in America, but also part of his story was the wider impact in the Middle East. He was in Yemen, he planned to stay in Yemen, and then the war hit to get out of Yemen. He had to wait on his own for his mother wait, wait to look after his mother while his brother went to get a visa in america and then you know subsequently well you hear the story in the film how they go on a small fishing boat for which should have been for 25 people and 300 of them travel to get the visa and then come to america um and so we felt that actually his journey which his life would have been so different had 9 11 not happened he wouldn't have had to have go through all of that was was really important yeah, I, I think it was really um, interesting as I was watching the film how we follow the lives over about 20, 19 to 20 years, looking back on um, old footage of these children growing up and where they are now and how they've taken different journeys. And I think it's fair to say that the thing that everyone has in common internationally is, is exploring the impact that 9-11 had on you. So I, I think that's that's really interesting to kind of look at how his story was very different to those who grew up in America. Absolutely, and we, and we felt you know that was important. And you you touched on the the pers the the personal archive, and that was obviously quite a key part of casting as well. We wanted to be able to see you know our young adults grow up, you know, and you sort of depending on when they're born, see the birthday parties where dad wasn't there, or see the graduations and and that but you feel closer to them as contributors yeah and um liz uh you directed um children of 9 11 your background includes filming portraits of michelle obama and nancy reagan for cnn is this quite different <laughs> <laughs> well yes but i should say that the nancy reagan and michelle obama were more of a shift from my usual filmmaking than this film was. I've done a lot of films with young people. I do a lot of observational films and I do a lot of intimate films. So um, this this was kind of up my alley. So um, talk us through the, the actual filming. I'd like to sort of understand a little bit more about the process that you took to really kind of, you know, facilitate, if you like, uh, this observational documentary and, and, and the title is Children 9-11, Our Story. Um, what were your methods for helping the contributors to tell their own story in their own voice? Well, obviously the approach, I mean, the, the, the plan changed radically thanks to COVID. Um, initially it was going to be much more, well, it was going to be observational. We were going to spend a you know decent amount of time with each of these contributors, um, which I think is an important point to pick up on in terms of casting. And Lucy mentioned this briefly, but one of the really, one of the most important things was to make sure that each of our contributors understood how much we would be asking of them, both emotionally in terms of, talking to their family about things they hadn't spoken about before, thinking about asking themselves questions they hadn't asked before. Um, but also, as we realized that we weren't going to get to the States quite as quickly as we thought we would, um, we came up with ideas about video diaries and, you know, encouraging them to film on their phones so we could track that year without actually being there. So that was the first step. And our producer, Abby Heron, did a huge amount of work kind of coaxing these 18 and 90 year olds to deliver what we needed, um, which wasn't always easy. 
Um, but they gave us some amazing stuff with an intimacy we would never have, have got with a film crew. Um, and then we did some remote shooting with, uh, you see in the film, um, we kind of introduced the remote shooting with um, some shots of the contributors setting up the camera. And we did uh, two days of that with everybody. And that, that turned out to be incredibly helpful because we got really intimate conversations. I was sort of a peer on a screen in their, in their living room or their kitchen table. Um, and they would have these very profound conversations that I don't, many of them hadn't had before. Um, and by the time we actually met them in the spring and went with a crew, um, we had a relationship and, and we'd been on a bit of an emotional journey already. Um, so we were able to focus quite um, quickly and efficiently on the things we wanted to film. We were able to get an intimacy and a naturalness that we wouldn't have if we just flown in uh, without doing all this other work. And then we did a lot of filming outside because of COVID, which also I think helped a lot with the tone of the, um, of the interviews. They're more reflective. They're less sort of, you know, under the, under the lights in a studio interrogations. They're much more, you know, you're staring at the water, staring at the trees. And, and I think it allowed them to be in their minds a bit. So yeah, it was an interesting journey. And our approach evolved as we went along. Yeah, I really like this idea of a box cam, which I understand you you shipped to all of the contributors in advance. I mean, it sort of harks to um, a sort of uh, keeping a journal, if you like, and and that sort of um, documentary program making. Did you feel? Um, a difference. I mean, I know that you said that you'd obviously personally built a relationship, but then suddenly turning up with a full film crew and uh, and filming things in a very different way. How did that affect the contributors, or did it? Well, first of all, I think they were um, they were surprised. <laughs> We were, we were so professional because we'd just been this strange little contraption that they'd had to put together on their kitchen table. And with one of the contributors, they opened the box and the camera fell out. I mean, it wasn't always easy, um, but they were all very game. And so I think that once we actually met them and, and showed up as a proper film crew, we had a great team. It was a small team. Um, we got along with everybody really well. Uh, and I think that they, they had the idea of collaboration in their minds. And I think that's a really important word in this film, not just with the co-production, but with the participants. Um, because they'd been through this, they understood that they had to be a bit more active and, and that we could talk together about what they were doing. And, you know, I think they, they seem to enjoy it. I mean, the feedback we got afterwards and, and since then, I think, and I think that's part of what makes the film work is that, you know, they're fully in this process and, and they're really with us the whole time. Yeah. Um, John, I'd, I'd like to come back to you again, you know, sort of going back to what you were saying at the beginning of, you know, obviously we're coming up to the 20th anniversary. You, you want to look forward. Um, to what extent do you feel um, you were able to to live up to the idea that you had, because obviously you're working with people where you're discovering their story and that's a story you want to tell. Um, and I wondered to what extent is this a 9-11 story or is this a story about Generation Z and six, seven young people? Um, it was nerve wracking because there was no, the only voice in the film was the kids and a little bit of their, their, um, their moms, their brothers, their sisters. And they had to be good. There was no host, there was no narration, uh, no experts, no one pontificating about their mental well-being. We, you know, we, we were gonna win or we we're gonna lose on the quality of the kids' uh, testimony. And, and because of the conditions that Liz was talking about, um, it was remarkably unfiltered and authentic and unproduced. It was a genuine voice. And that's what we were working with. And, you know, I used to worry, would we sustain on the American versions and the French version? It's two hours. That's a long, long documentary. Could we ever sustain? Um, but I had at the back of my mind, you know, I grew up, my first job was at Granada where I watched the Michael Apted seven up series emerge and be the global sort of hit that it was and that gave me confidence that they did it with apted 
And I'd seen a brilliant film two, three years ago, American film called Minding the Gap, about three young kids growing up in the Rust Belt, which was in their voices and, and remarkable things had happened to those kids. So you knew you could pull it off, but it was a real cutting room film as well. And you know, to give them credit, we were given constant encouragement by, by Bill, by Danny, by Arte to do it this way. And also you make an important point and I noticed some of the reviews picked up on that. It's a very different 9-11 film because it is about six or seven kids growing up in this turbulent 20 years of America but they have this unique attachment to an event that has defined those 20 years. And, and I think we were strongly encouraged and maybe Bill and Danny would speak to this, the, you know, to, to hear that voice, not just endlessly go back to the day, which none of them, you know, a lot of them didn't even know about it until they were eight or nine. So we, we, we were quite deliberately in that territory of sort of being a 9-11 film but a different one and one that talks about life in the 20 years afterwards quite deliberately um, as well. And we were strongly encouraged by all of our, our partners to, to, you know, to go along that track. But it was scary because you just don't know if you've got the material to sustain that running length. Yeah. And um, thank you uh, for talking about that process and um, just for the audience that we talk about six or seven contributors there are, are slightly different versions uh, of um, children of 9-11 our story um, here in the UK on Channel 4 compared to PBS Generation 9-11 and Arte which brings us to a really interesting um, point and Bill and Danny I'd love to um, bring you in here it's it's still a fairly unique model um, of commissioning to do this kind of three-way international commission. I really like to hear a bit more about that. Bill, perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about where the idea came from and at, at what stage um, you felt that a co-commission was the appropriate way to go. Sure, I'm very glad to talk about this. I think um, I would echo what you've heard from, from everybody so far about why it was attractive, but I think this is a business of relationships. And uh, I think when you find people of a similar mind who have similar interests and in types of stories you want to tell and what you want to say, you uh, cultivate those. Uh, you know, John and I spend a lot of time just speaking about the world and, you know, what's happening in it and our perceptions of it. Similarly with Danny and um, some of our partners in Arte. And I think we all realized that uh, for this anniversary, there was going to be plenty of content out there about the day, about the decisions that were made in the immediate aftermath, the political point of view, the geopolitics and so forth. What would be something different? And in just conversations with, uh, again, with, with um, the, my fellow people on the panel here, we all felt that there's an additional story to tell a really interesting one that probably wouldn't be told by the commercial media. Uh, and that is like, what is the world that we made after 9-11? You know, I myself was uh, there when the plane hit the Pentagon. So I very familiar with the day and what it was. And for me, I felt, you know, I didn't need to relive that. Um, and there is plenty of media that would be reliving that, but what happened afterward? How did we respond? You know, for someone uh, of some of our ages, I think 9-11 was looked at as, as kind of the trigger for a new age, so to speak. I mean, how do kids growing up now feel about that? When you look back at the world that they've lived through for the last 20 years, how much of it was impacted by 9-11? How much of it was impacted by other things, you know, and the repercussions of it? I think the conversation that we've had about Ferris, uh, I thought that um, the way that Lucy laid that out is exactly right. I mean, even though he grew up in Yemen, you can't say at all, you know, letting alone his, the, his relationship with his father, that everyone in Yemen hasn't been impacted by 9-11 in some way. And I think that oftentimes in the States, we tend to think about everything in our own point of view, but this is clearly while well, it happened here, it was very much a global event, global impact. And in speaking with, again, with people like Danny and John, like these are sentiments we share, we talk about these types of things. So for me at PBS uh, and representing PBS, we wanna have these types of partnerships that allow us to tell stories that might not otherwise happen. And I would just you know, wrap up your, the answer to your question by saying that um, this is how it goes. When you, when you talk to like-minded individuals and you think about the types of statements that you want to make as broadcasters, when you have an opportunity to do something that you think can really say something different with like-minded partners, you seize it and you jump on it and you take advantage of the opportunity that it provides. Uh, thanks. Well, I mean, this is, you can 
truly call this an, an international program all the way from commissioning through to the contributors. Um, and Danny, um, how, how long was that um, development period? Obviously, you've been talking for quite a while. And um, to what extent do you, um, do you each come to the, the room with your different views and what you're looking for on what works for your audience on your channels? I think I think at the very beginning, the you know the headline idea that John came to us with was um, was was straightforward. You know, it didn't it didn't um, you know there was some nuance and it changed a bit. But actually, trying to find a film that was future facing about nine eleven was a thing that really appealed to us. Exactly the same thing that Bill's saying. You know, appealed to them too because you know we ourselves have made lots of programs like PBS. I've done two, you know, where it's looking, where it's retelling the events of the day and the sort of immediate impact it may have had. But what we've not had is a film which really is about hope. It's massively about hope, actually, is what, how I, what I take from it. And I always thought that's what it would deliver, is these young kids, you know, they might not have um, first-hand witness the dramatic trauma of the day, but what they they have felt that and the repercussions of that they've had in their families for 20 years. But most of them, all, all of them in the film, have, have a sort of extraordinary young people who've got amazing hope and, in, and, a, and a very um, insightful view of the world, which was, we, we hoped that would be the case, of course. So when we started to... Um, develop it, which we did. We did a development, a paid development period. We hoped um, John and his team would find those contributors, and we were heartened when those started to come through and realised it was a film we definitely need to um, be part of and, and invest in. And it, and in some ways, when we were in the commissioning process in Channel Four, you know, some people um, in the building were asking. Do we think it will do well? Does 9-11, does the sons of the younger generation 9-11, will it resonate? Is it just going to be a lot of American voices? And of course, well, one is mostly American voices, but um, of course there is Faraz who's from Yemen, as, as you've mentioned. But um, and we were keen as well to have a very diverse range of stories. Um, and I think this story, 9-11 is a, is a huge, was a huge world event of the generation that's on this call even. It's probably the greatest defining event um, for many reasons and continues to be um, even like, to look at the sort of ramifications for out of Afghanistan in the last few days. That all started, much of it started because of 9-11. And, um, and that's now possibly going to have um, a similar impact around the world with the Taliban taking control in Afghanistan. And that is a story that connects with 9-11, of course. And um, Bill and I had lots of conversations separately and together with John and Arte about this project. And we just very like-minded about this subject and others. I mean, Bill and I are doing a, uh, one other together, um, big co-commission together. You know, we... Um, you know, there is a commercial interest for us to be doing co-commissions with other platforms and streamers and broadcasters around the world. We've got stuff with Netflix. But what it's very easy to say that's what we want to do, but actually finding the like-minded people who are in the, those seats at that particular time deciding what gets commissioned is not always easy. Um, but I find it, um, it's been great with... Uh, Bill, we've got very similar interests, and we want to try and do more together, and um, and I'll say too. So, yeah, and um, the the structure of the story. I mean, of course, it's all it all starts. The story that uh, is told in the film uh, starts from nine eleven, um, but you touch on a huge range of. Um, current affairs and issues, uh, largely in America, but across the world. We cover the, the recent American uh, elections, we cover uh, shootings in schools. Um, there's, there's an absolute, and, and of course, not to mention the civil war in Yemen, which you've already alluded to. There is a huge amount 
in here uh, where suddenly you think, how did you pack all of that into two hours? What was um, the thinking in terms of how you would structure the film? So starting from 9-11, moving forward and the sorts of questions that you were asking uh, the contributors and their experiences um, going through the ages, uh, through the ages, through the 20 years. Where did that structure come from? Was that something that you thought of in advance or did it come out um, in the edit? Um, Lucy, could you talk a bit about that? I can talk a bit about that. Yes, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's really sort of co-question with Liz, who, who was directing it. I think the, the wonderful challenge and outcome that came from this is obviously as a, a group of people of sort of certain ages, you and as naturally as producers and, and directors, you sit down and you want to plan a film. But the premise behind this is that these with these people's story. So you can write down as much as you want what you want them to talk about. But you might say, tell me about this event. And they go, I was eight. I don't really remember. And then that kind of gets thrown out quite quickly. So it was very much a collaboration with the contributors in working out what events do they remember and what what shaped their lives and then taking the film around that. So it was very much in the edit and it was it was very collaborative. But I think Liz can add more to that sort of journey. You know, it, it, it's edgy to try and do that. But I think you, we ended up with a, a much truer film to their story and what has impacted their lives than us trying to produce onto them what we thought their lives, what they should be telling us about their lives. Yeah, Liz, I'd, I'd love to hear more about that. And, and also if there are any common themes that you found particularly surprising and kind of shaped the journey that you subsequently took. Yeah, I mean, I think that the idea, you know, John mentioned 7up and, and obviously, you know, a retrospective seven up is a different kind of prospect, but that was in our, in our minds. We kind of, I mean, initially we made a timeline of big events that we thought um, would have impacted their lives. And as Lucy said, um, some of them, they had no memory of at all. And some of them, they had a lot to say about. And the nice thing about an ensemble piece is that you can give different contributors, different pieces to respond to. So we did a lot of timelines with them. Um, we kind of did, uh, we did two interviews with each of them, a timeline interview, which was about life passing. Um, you know, it, this is a very American story. So we wanted kind of American, uh, um, big American moments, getting your driver's license, you know, graduating from high school, middle school, obviously school shootings, as you said. And then, you know, um, I ran through all of that with them, um, kind of slices. We, we had the idea from the beginning that we would use chronology and these sort of slices of life and, and looking at where our different contributors were at these, at these key moments. But also in terms of the, the themes that jumped through, I think one thing that a lot of them said, almost all of them said, and there are very few things that almost all of them said, was that there was a sense after 9-11 of America coming together. It might have been in a slightly xenophobic way, you know, whatever, but there was a sense of unity and patriotism that was very strong. And when they came of age politically, their world was defined by division, very aggressive division, and they were all very aware of that. Um, and I think it was what was really interesting um, for me and I think also for the contributors and hopefully for an American audience is that in addition to all the other diversities we talked about, we have a real diversity in political views among these kids. And, you know, to hear each of them really earnestly talk about the Trump years, Obama, Black Lives Matter, all of these, you know, things which loom very large in their lives right now. Um, from very different perspectives but but by the time they're saying what they're saying you've really come to identify with them and you know feel for them and so even if they say something you don't agree with it's it's much harder to react the way you would if you were watching a new show where people are fighting with each other um so i think that the idea of how america finds unity again is kind of a theme that i found really interesting and not that we even begin to answer it but there's something hopeful as danny said earlier about listening to all of these voices together um, struggling with these questions very earnestly um, and with, you know, a decent amount of insight. Yeah, thank you. Um, and Danny, it was mentioned earlier um, that uh, a lot of young people today, they won't remember 9-11. It's not like maybe for all of us where we probably all remember where we were and what happened um, when we heard the news. Um, how's, it, how's it going? What are the numbers like on um, all four? Yeah, I mean, I think they, uh, are, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's a, a younger, 
young people won't remember it, won't have lived through it, and won't remember where they were because they might not even been born, even. But, but I think, look, we all, like, like I was saying, I think it's such a defining moment in, in modern history that we are reminded of it at every, um, it, it, we're reminded of it a lot in programming and also just the way we live our lives, right? So, um, so I think young people have got a particular interest in it because it's defined a lot of the way we live and our relationship with the Middle East um, and, uh, and our relationship with Britain, with America too. So, um, so far it's doing well on the, um, we've only had, it's only been up for 36 hours on our platform um, on all four, but the numbers are good. The numbers are encouraging. Um, they are higher than we would expect at this point, which indicates that it's a younger audience watching it. So um, that's very, very encouraging and the thing that we really hoped for. Yeah, and, and Bill, same thing, obviously it hasn't aired in uh, the US yet, um, but similar idea of, in, in a way, yes, this is a 9-11 story, but actually it is the story of Gen Z kids um, growing up, becoming um, young adults in America. So um, I'm really interested to know your thoughts on how you hoped to position this film, how you hope to um react uh, and kind of engage with younger audiences in america well it's an interesting film for those who watch it here because it, people have different reactions to it depending how old they are too you know like you know some of the older audience like these are some of their kids and you're very much looking at the world that we made um, I found it a very humbling watch. Some of the things that perhaps I went into this expecting the kids felt differently about. I think as Liz points out, there's a lot of different perspective. And I think that it's, you know, I really want to publicly say this. I think what the team did is absolutely amazing. I mean, the amount of time that they had with these kids uh, wasn't enormous, you know, because of COVID. And you really see them go through this journey over the course of their lives. And I think just now they're really getting that they are somewhat talismanic for this event and they're as they wrestle with themselves you get to feel it um so i think you know to danny's point on a different platform for us than normal broadcasts i, I expect that uh, younger people will gravitate to it i also think in all the territories this is going to have a long tail people will come to it and find it because it really is a snapshot of 20 years uh, and it's really surprising in some of the things that people react to. And, you know, I think also, um, I think Liz made a really good point that we went from a period of unity to a lot of division right now, but then it's not always along the lines that you might, one might think, or an audience member of a certain age might think, you know, there are some of these kids who are on one particular persuasion, but they might have a different kind of feeling about criminal justice reform or about, you know, the George Floyd murders and, and black uh, murder and black lives matter and so forth. So I think there's some something for everybody in the film in ways that they might not expect. So I think that we'll see um, good pickup across all ages. Yeah, thank you. We've got um, uh, quite a few questions flooding in. Um, to begin with, um, John, I wanted to find out if there is any intention to stay in touch with um, the, the families and the people that you spoke to. We have a question around, um, did the contributors get to meet up with each other? Have there been any kind of virtual meetups? Um, it's funny, you, um, I've been asked two or three times, are we gonna do, it's like seven up again, are we gonna do a, a 30 up? Are we gonna do something on the 30th anniversary? And <laughs> I, I'm starting to think actually it's quite an interesting idea. And also because the kids themselves, will be reaching the same age as their fathers were at the point of their, um, their sad deaths on 9-11. And uh, I think, um, you know, it may be interesting tracking to them and, and uh, tracking them and seeing what happens to them in the next 10 years. And if the next 10 or anything like the last 20, then that's quite a, quite a journey. Uh, if things had been normal, I'm sure we would have brought all the kids together at the national 9-11 uh, memorial and museum uh, at ground zero in new york and uh, uh but we couldn't do that because of covid and i think a lot of liz would be able to speak to this because i think they were all really keen to meet each other and may well do so separately because there's this very exclusive club of 105 of them with this unique and powerful emotional connection and and that uh you know it would have been great to be able to do that but sadly you just can't do that sort of thing at the moment yeah. 
And what kind of responsibility do you feel as the producers of this programme, having taken these um, 20 year olds through 19 to 20 year olds through potentially for the first time a really difficult journey? All right. Um, well, I mean, a lot is the, the short answer, but after, I mean, as I said earlier, a really important part of the casting was making sure that they understood what we were asking of them and where where we hoped they would go. And, you know, it's not like no one's ever thought of interviewing these people before. They've had, they've had you know, they, there hasn't been a documentary like this, but they've been approached by the media since they were babies. Um, they've done news things. And some of the 105 have done a lot of media and we, we um, specifically steered away from people who kind of had a feeling of a patness to the story because they were used to telling it. Um, these people were were much, I mean, you see in the film that Ronald's done quite a bit of press, but nothing like this. And the rest of them hadn't hadn't spoken to anyone really before. And, you know, we made sure they understood what was involved. Um, we've sent them all, you know, emails about support that's available. We've, you know, given them advice about how to watch the film. As John said, we would have liked to have watched it all together and they're watching it with their families and we're getting good feedback from them. But yeah, I mean, we're, we're not dropping our relationship now by any means. And we had a PBS um, press event last week, uh, which f several of them were at and a couple of them said it had been quite therapeutic having these conversations they kind of wanted to have but hadn't had before. And as as you mentioned, they all did express the desire. They said it was amazing to hear other people who had been through what they'd been through. They felt very alone. Um, and I really hope somebody involved in the production will find a way to coordinate some sort of virtual meetup because I think they'd get a lot out of that. Yeah, I think that'd be really interesting. And I, I do hope that that the appropriate support is available to them and and indeed to the entire production team. It's a, a really emotional and, and critical um, story and, and path. Uh, we have a question here uh, saying, did the families realise they were speaking for a generation? Um, Liz, you're, you're nodding your head there. You've, you've spoken a lot about being very, very clear about the expectations from the beginning. Just very briefly, I mean, the pitch they were given before I was on board, when the film was initially called Generation 9-11, uh, the Arrow had developed something that was very explicitly, this isn't just about your loss, this is also about what it's been like growing up over the last 20 years, what what the world, you know, how, how you've how you hope to shape the world and how the world has shaped you. So, you know, we did pitch this as a, a tell us about your generation. And a lot of the interview was, had nothing to do with 9-11, was about generational perspectives, you know, what it's like being 19 now. So yeah, they, they were all really enthusiastic about the chance to say how they saw the world. Um, Danny and Bill, um, another question. Uh, did the broadcasters have opinions at the edit stage? Um, I'm sure that you would have had opinions and to, to what extent uh, are you able to feed those in? We never have opinions. <laughs> and if we do, they don't get listened to. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, of course. I mean, look, we um, actually probably it was the moment where we might have diverged slightly, actually, with PBS, um, ju just partly because of our um, time, um, our running times. But but also we we just wanted we were less um we were we we did we were less interested on the focus of some of these very specific american events that might not have resonated quite in the same way with a uk audience when you reference other shootings and so on so that was the only moment where we um where we probably diverged a tiny bit and that was based on what audio what we thought audiences really would um um would resonate more so but yeah we did we did I mean it was a it was a brilliant process I mean everyone was it was one of my commissioning editors who did the day-to-day -day, um editorial on it and he loved the process and found it very creative and really collaborative with ev with everyone all the partners including you know Bill and, and, and Arte but but of course everyone who would uh, the producers too um, I've worked on many co-pros and they can be a complete and utter nightmare um, the partners can be really assertive about the version they want and don't really care about what country X or country Y want. They want their version. 
And the nightmare is you end up making two or three very different versions of a film. And it's, it's a real pain. And the only thing that suffers is the film itself. And uh, I'm not just saying it because they're on the screen in front of me, but there was a really good ethos on this production from the very early days. I remember we all had a meeting in Channel 4 and the French and Bill were over about working together and essentially making the same film. There were that, that you know, small change that Danny mentioned and in part it was because their version was half an hour shorter because of the reality of Channel 4 running times. But there was an incredibly good, there was spirited discussion when we selected from the 20 to get our seven or six characters, but it was consensus prevailed and everybody worked in that spirit from day one of the production to the end. And it doesn't always happen, often it doesn't. And it really made a difference. And ultimately, it's a win-win because Channel 4, PBS, Arte are getting uh, a very high quality, well-made film and they're sharing the cost. And when you get a decent budget, budget is about time. Budget buys you time. It was that budget that bought us the nine months to research the 105 characters and present them with 55 and then 20 characters that you could make, pick from a really rich selection of individuals. And it was that money that gave you 22, 23 weeks in an edit because this is such a complex film to edit. Often you in documentaries, you have six, seven, eight weeks time. You had that amount of time to craft something. So that's why it's win-win. And, and those are the factors that, that you know make it, when it works, such a good way to go. And I wish it was always like that. But when you have a good experience like this, it makes you want to continue doing it. I would just add that, you know, as John pointed out from the beginning of that, that meeting in Channel 4, we all kind of agreed and knew what we were largely trying to do and, you know, find the best ways to get there. And for me, some of the conversations we had, I found really illustrative about things that maybe were important uh, or what resonated with me as an American commissioner, I mean, how it was seen uh, from other points of view. And as much as we could, we tried to find ways to kind of get that sentiment in there a little bit. You know, I mean, the French had no idea what a, a prom even is. I know for you all, it's classical you know, music for us. It's the, when you're 18, you have a big formal dance. It's hugely important here. So how do you kind of get through these cultural references? And I think that, you know, Liz being there um, as someone, you know, in both places in America and living in London, she found ways to, to kind of navigate through and, and give us all kind of the points we were trying to make with and minimizing some of the things that were potentially tangents. But to me, I think, you know, it goes to the theme we said about this from the beginning is we all knew what we were trying to do and it was that larger goal that kind of drove us all that was the one stipulation that we had bill was very from day one i want an american director on this now that's a worry if you're trying to run a production out of london and to give channel four their credit and arte they understood where bill was coming from because he wanted that understanding but we were fortunate in finding liz that we had someone who'd grown up in America, who'd been in New York on 9-11, but had spent a lot of time in Britain, so understood sensibilities on both sides of, of, of the Atlantic. But that, you know, that's another good example of something very important for one partner that the other two could, um, could, uh, could work with. You know? And I remember uh, one of Danny's commissioning editors who's moved on, who's from a Muslim background herself, was very strongly, strongly talking passionately about the need for that voice. Of course, everyone wanted that, but she, you know, she really drove that initiative because it was um, it was a, a, a difficult challenge, and I'm so pleased that we were able to find Faraz. But again, you know, we all listened to her and that, and 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 were able to work together to um, to accommodate that. So it's just, it's really good when it happens well, and it's a nightmare when it doesn't. And I, I understand you had a French editor, is that right? Yes, Claire Guillon was the editor. She's absolutely brilliant. I've worked with her before. Um, she's been in, in London for a very long time and would say that her French sensibility is, is slightly muted, but I'm sure it helped. She's fantastic. And, um, Bill, I, you and Danny have both uh, stressed the importance of being able to 
to work well with um, commissioning partners and the desire to do more. And I, I believe, feel free to tell us all uh, you have some projects in the pipeline. Um, but to what extent is that really important in in shaping the stories that you want to tell and and the way that the programmes are made for PBS? Well, you know, Danny said this earlier, is like there's a desire to do that. You, you need to find the right project that it really works on. Um, and I think that, you know, as a variety service in PBS, like we're airing Downton Abbey and Call the Midwife. Um, so there's that audience that's there, but there's also, you know, this desire that we have and we feel as, as the PSB in the States, like we want to tell more um, additional stories that you maybe have a global point of view or a different attitude. You know, we co-pro with the BBC on some things and as everybody knows, Channel 4 has a little bit different sensibility than other networks. And I want to do as much as we possibly can. And I think that um, when there are certain topics that need to be covered in a certain way or a certain point of view, you know, who are your, your partners and, and the people that you know well. Uh, and as I said in the beginning, you know, the role of all of us in these commissioning uh, spaces, it's to stay as close to the production community as we can. But we also talk to each other a lot. You know, what are some interests? What are some things that we can we share uh, alignment on and can kind of elevate uh, projects by both of us putting in resources um, that is to, as John said, to elevate some of these budgets. You know, we're not the streamers. We don't have an unlimited checkbook, but I think we also have some different sensibilities too. So the more that we can come together to, to do that, the better. Uh, and I think, especially when it comes to some cultural stories, uh, sometimes finding those that line up can be trickier, straight factual can be easier. But again, the, the sensibility that we have and an interest in telling stories from maybe a different kind of a point of view. And, um, you know, when you find people that you have that familiarity with and a similar sensibility, you maximize it and you try to do as much as you can while you can. Yeah, I look forward to some, some more brilliant collaborations. Uh, we have another question asking and uh, noticing um, a credit to Tuesday's Child. Um, I, I believe that's the production company. What was their involvement? Um, John, I think that's for you. Uh, they're the organization that connects um, to works with a lot of the families that lost a loved one in 9-11. In and I think it was, I think Lucy will correct me on this, but I think they or, or Liz, uh, they were one of the people we worked with that had some database um, about um, the fathers who died when the, 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 um, the, the waiting for expectant, you know, waiting for the, the partner for the, for the baby to, to arrive. And uh, I think they had a list and then we managed to find beyond that. But Lucy was there and I think we contacted that we worked with them um, in other things as well. Yes, I think the the important thing is, that, you know, when you're approaching these families, it was it was you, you touched on it earlier as well. You know, it's important to be so sensitive and to think about their overall well-being, not just their involvement in the film. And we didn't want to just cold reach out to families because we'd seen them on a news program or they'd been in this documentary. We wanted to do things and make them realize that we were very genuine and this was a collaboration. And we worked with Tuesday's Child Early in some of the early development to make some of that initial contact so that families would know that we were coming from a very genuine place and we wanted to reach out um, collaboratively. And so, so, so that was their involvement. Yeah, I think that that's really interesting. It kind of it speaks more to those collaborations and and how we work together to really get the best stories. Yeah. Um, something else I found really interesting, which we alluded to earlier, is that the sheer amount that is mentioned um, throughout the program. So, of course, we have the stories of the six or seven contributors. I was really fascinated by the stories of the widows and uh, of the other siblings. And I think um, the widows in particular, uh, and some of them, you, you got a brief mention. And then I thought, oh, well, well, what was that? Can I find out more about those stories? And I have to say, uh, the two that really stuck out was um, uh, the uh, lady who delivers TED Talks, uh, whose husband uh, was su 
seemingly sat near or next to one of the terrorists on the plane. And the other one that I was really, really interested to know more about, um, where do I find out more about setting up a group and fundraising, recognizing that there are hundreds, if not thousands of widows in Afghanistan and wider in the Middle East who are who are living the same lives as these women, uh, the mothers in the USA. Uh, could you tell me a little bit about how you make a decision of which of those bits to include and how you don't just go down a rabbit hole in that story? And also, could you tell me where I can find out more? Because I think they're fantastic stories. Yeah, I mean, I you know, the, the mantra was <laughs> this is the kids POV. So, you know, there were lots of the, the, the widows were amazing. I mean, all of them, I would say. And in an early cut, when all we had was the box cam to work with, their stories were much longer because <laughs> we were so taken with them. Um, but, you know, this is a film about Generation 9-11, children of 9-11, and we had to be very rigorous about not going too far down those rabbit holes. Um, they were amazing. They had such profound things to say, all of them. Um, but yeah. You know, wasn't their story? They 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 set up the. We tried to include them only insofar as their experience had shaped the children. That was kind of what we kept in the back of our minds. Um, and Susan Rettick um, is, if you look her up, she you'll find her TED talk. And I think, oh God, Beyond the Eleventh. That's the name of her charity, which she set up working with Afghan women. So you should be able to, with those pieces of information, R-E-T, there you go. Um, you should be able to find her online. Uh, and she is, she is amazing. And her life is, you know, she, she, you know, devoted herself to charity work and, and also lifestyle coaching because she's worked that into a, a way of seeing the world and understanding the world and how you're shaped by your experiences. But yeah, the, the mothers were incredible. Yeah, and also really interesting in the context of the stories of um, the kids because uh, they've grown up with this. And there's a really touching um, moment with Nick and his mother, I, I believe at the 9-11 Memorial in New York, uh, where he basically says, this this is your story, not mine. You, you had to live through that. I wasn't even born. Um, no more spoilers. Um, please do all go and watch it if you haven't already. Um, it's streaming now on all four. And if you're not in the UK, then do stand by because it's coming to you soon. Um, I'm afraid we're just about running out of time. Thanks everyone uh, for the questions that you sent in. And a huge thank you to our panel, our international panel today. We have Bill Gardner, Danny Horan, John Smithson, Lucy Redoubt, and Liz Berman. Huge thanks for joining us today. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for this session will be available to catch up and watch again, or please do share it if you enjoyed it. You can find it on the RTS London YouTube channel. Please do subscribe to the channel um, to watch other events from RTS London as well. We also have an RTS London podcast, um, so you can search for that and listen if you prefer to our past events. We really hope to be able to return to some in-person sessions in London soon in the autumn. We will also continue to hold some online events. Have a look at the RTS London website. That's rts.org.uk forward slash region forward slash London. And we'll list all of our upcoming events on there. Huge thanks again to my panel. Thank you all for attending this online session and have a lovely rest of day. Goodbye. <laughs>